All right, so it's just about 7.02. Um, let's see, we have 13 folks on the call. I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and get started with some of the housekeeping stuff. And uh, that'll take a couple minutes and then we'll get to John's presentation. So thanks everybody for joining. I just wanna do a bit of housekeeping on Zoom. For those of you who aren't aware, this session is being recorded. So if you want your camera on, that's great. And if you'd rather have your camera off, that is perfectly fine too. Uh, participants will be muted. Um, if you have a question later on in the discussion, we're more than happy to unmute you so that you can ask your question directly. Uh, if you have questions during John's presentation, you can type it into chat. If you're not aware, that's the little icon at the bottom of the screen with the little speech bubble. Or you can feel free to raise your hand, which is in the participant box. If you click the icon, there's a blue hand. So thanks again for joining us, especially if this is your first Hingham Net Zero event. Um, for those of you who are new to our group, we're a grassroots citizens group advocating for ambitious climate action within our town with the goal of achieving net zero emissions. Uh, we are a committed and dedicated group of volunteers who are passionate about seeing our town transition to a low carbon future. And we advocate for a low carbon future in a number of ways. We engage with town officials to adopt and promote climate friendly plans and policies. Um, just this week, we were chatting with the Board of Selectmen pushing for the creation of a climate action plan for our town. Um, of course, we want to increase awareness of the climate crisis and we do that through forms such as the such as these where we can educate residents on different strategies and technologies to reduce their household carbon footprint. And we also provide individual climate coaching to support Hingham residents with their carbon reduction efforts. And John Borger is one of our climate coaches. Um, I tease him that he probably has the lowest carbon footprint of all in all of Massachusetts. He is incredibly knowledgeable on a range of low carbon technologies. He is very detail oriented and does extensive research when he's tackling a project. So he has a lot of really great information to share with you on solar panels and he's the perfect climate coach if you guys decide to pursue um, installing solar at your home. So we are expecting someone from Energy New England. Let me see, I can't tell if he's on the call. His name is Valdir, Valdir Aliati. He, and is, he, he is with us. He is with us, perfect. Welcome Valdir, thanks so much for joining us. Um, he's not giving the presentation. Hi, he's not giving the presentation with John, but he uh, may have some helpful insights <laughs> later on when we're talking about um, incentives. So on that note, I am going to hand it over to my friend John for his um, presentation on the solar. Terrific. Let me uh, let me share my screen. And uh, can everybody see that? I think you can. Thank you, Anne, for that gracious uh, introduction as usual. I always find Anne's introductions to be sort of aspirational. Uh, something that I you know, have to try to live up to, but so we'll, we'll do our best tonight. Um, let's jump right into it because we want to use your time well, and this is what we're going to try to do to this evening. Uh, we want to provide you a solid grounding in solar terms and concepts. Uh, for example, net metering, what does that mean? We want to help you understand how residential solar actually works mechanically uh, we want to acquaint you with internet links that will really help you get started immediately. In a few minutes, you can get a pretty good idea of whether or not you have a solar viable roof. And we'll, we'll tell you about that later. Um, I want to introduce you to what I've come to think of as the two streams of value uh, from solar. And we'll give you the uh, specific information that we have on subsidies, incentives, and loans uh, that are available to you. We'll use a detailed financial example to help you understand the scale of the solar savings uh, and understand a little bit about financing a solar installation and managing the cash flow to maximize your return. Um, there are some trade-offs and risks, and we'll talk about that. 
Uh, we want you to understand how the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant has implemented solar in Hingham. Generally, we want to equip you with basic information that you're going to need to interact effectively with solar contractors, the lighting plant, sources of financing, and others. Um, and my goal, and I think we're going to be able to accomplish this, is that I think when we're done this evening, in about an hour, we'll try to keep it under an hour, you're going to know more than certainly I knew when I put solar panels on my roof uh, three years ago. Um, and that's a good thing. So we're going to try to demystify residential solar. Um, uh, there are some slides in the back of the presentation that are more detailed that have to do with data and methodology and assumptions, um, some resources for solar loans, for instance. So I'll point those out to you um, as, we, uh, as we wind up the uh, presentation. Okay. Here's the good news. Solar is cheap and it's getting cheaper, according to the, to the Solar Energy Industries Association. Uh, the cost of an average size solar array has declined from $40,000 about 10 years ago to about $18,000 today. I was talking with Michael Reeve the, uh, uh, last evening, and, and he was observing this sort of a Moore's Law that's operating uh, relative to solar. Moore's Law, of course, said that every couple of years, um, you know, with the new generation of chips, computing power doubles and your costs are cut in half. And that's not quite that dramatic with solar panels, but with the additional volume, the cost is really coming down. And you're gonna find that solar panels will really significantly reduce, and in some cases practically eliminate your electric bill. Even a small array on a, gar a garage roof can partially offset your costs and we have at least one member of Hingham Net Zero, uh, Brenda Black and her husband, Ron, they've done that and uh, it's worked for them. So one of the things that's gonna become uh, quickly apparent to you is that residential solar has a long-term payback. Um, the useful, the, the guaranteed life of the panels is typically 25 years. I have LG panels, they're guaranteed for 25 years. No questions asked, just straight replacement if any of them fail. The useful life is typically beyond the 25 years. It can be as much as 30 or 40 years. There's little or no maintenance required. They just sit up there and chug away year after year. Um, what you may have to do uh, between maybe years 10 and uh, 20 um, is replace a little magic box, which we'll talk about, called an inverter. But that's fairly short money. It's basically about a, you know, an, an expensive car repair. It's about 2000 bucks. Um, solar retains value. This is not like putting a, a swimming pool in your backyard where you may or may not get a portion of your investment back. Forbes magazine did a study and found uh, that you're going to get 97% of your investment back for solar. And Zillow estimates that solar panels increase the value of your house by about 4.1%. So that's significant. Uh, last time I looked, the median price of a home in Hingham was about a little more than $800,000. So we're talking like $33,000, $34,000. As you'll see, that's more than the cost of the system that we're going to discuss tonight. But of course, in real estate, we all know that your house is worth what someone's willing to pay you for it on the day that you need to or want to sell. But it's clearly a long-term investment and it has, it retains its value. Um, okay, let's talk about the incentives for purchasing solar. The federal tax credit is now 26% of the total cost of the project. It used to be 30, it's now 26. That's still pretty generous. And the key thing here is total cost. So if you've got to do things like moving or expanding your electric service, or even replacing your roof, or moving vents or stacks or whatever, that's all included in the total cost of the project. And you get a, this tax credit from the feds uh, equal to 26% of that total cost. And that's not an exemption, it's not a deduction, it's straight money back on your return. return. It's, a, it's, a, it's a credit. Um, we got an election coming up and um, you know maybe that will, the percentage will increase, but it's pretty generous as it is, as you'll see. Um, the state tax credit is a flat amount, which is calculated based on the size of your array. Most average uh, residential installations are going to easily qualify for the $1,000 uh, state tax credit. Um, and then, 
as we'll discuss, um, excuse me for a minute, um, the municipal light plant has partnered with uh, the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources uh, for uh, in a program for towns with municipal utilities like, like Hingham. And uh, this uh, is called the uh, Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant Energy Efficiency and Conservation Program. And uh, the DOER provides a rebate in the form of a check equal to, uh, let's see, 60 cents, I believe. I, you know, the um, <laughs> little picture, the thumbnail pictures over here are obscuring some of my, uh, some of my slides. So let me, uh, let me see if I can get a better view here. Um, so anyway, it's, it, the DOR, uh, DOER rebate is 60 cents times the designed capacity of the system in watts up to a maximum of 10,000 watts, that's 10 kilowatts. So up to a maximum of $6,000. Uh, so for our system, the system we're gonna deal with tonight in the example, we've got a 6.8 kilowatt system, 6,800 watts, times that 60 cents means you're gonna get a check for $4,080. Um, and then the light plant matches that, but they don't give you a check, they give you a bill credit. And we'll, we'll talk about how that plays out. And the combined incentives in this program are capped at uh, $12,000, okay? Now, the first question that you wanna ask is, is my roof suitable for solar panels? And you can find out, you can answer that question in a few minutes. Just go to Google Project Sunroof, there's the link. You enter your address and Sunroof returns an overview of your roof and others in your neighborhood. It's very interesting. And they give you a few, some metrics like, you know, the average number of uh, hours of usable sunlight and the number of square feet on your roof that are available for panels. The best part of this is it will give you, at a glance, uh, an idea of how, uh, what I call solar viable your roof is. And they do that by highlighting your roof in shades of yellow. And the brighter shade of yellow they're highlighting your roof with, uh, the better your roof is for, for solar. And then if you uh, enter your average monthly electric bill, it'll return some other metrics, which I list here. Um, some of this stuff's a little out of date. The incentives, I think they did more on a regional basis. So they're not Massachusetts uh, specific. And uh, so we're gonna give you better information about incentives. Um, they have an algorithm that tries to calculate uh, estimated net savings for your roof over 20 years. If you put solars up, years to pay back your investment. Again, um, that's all interesting as a starting point. Uh, what I would advise you to do, if you think that you have a solar viable roof, is get some solar companies in, and we'll give you the names of at least a couple later on. They'll come in and they'll do a similar analysis, but they've got, it, it'll be much more refined and they'll do the same kinds of metrics. Um, they're gonna calculate the optimal size and the number and placement of the panels. Uh, importantly, they're gonna tell you the relative efficiency of panels on your roof. So for instance, I use Boston Solar and they scored my roof at uh, 87%, which is pretty high. They were, they were very enthusiastic. Uh, their cutoff for, uh, oh, actually the, the cutoff for state subsidized, I think, solar loans is 70%. They told me that panels, uh, they've, they've installed panels on roofs with ratings as low as 60%. So if you're really motivated and you, and, 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 and the financials look okay to you, uh, you know, you still have that as an option. They'll evaluate what condition your roof is in and whether they advise you to replace it. General rule is if your roof is less than 10 years old and it's in pretty good shape, you usually don't need to think about replacing it. Um, and they'll typically tell you what percentage of your current uh, electricity bill and usage in kilowatt hours uh, your panels are gonna replace. So for instance, my panels uh, replace about 93.5% of what I was using uh, before, of course, I installed heat pumps, which <laughs> changed things dramatically, but that's another presentation. Uh, solar in Hingham, there's tremendous potential. 
And this is really exciting because the other thing that uh, Project Sunroof does is uh, you can inquire by zip code. And uh, so for our zip code, 023 in Hingham, uh, they say there were 19 solar installations. I added Laura Burns' recent <laughs> installation came up with 20, but we all agree that that sort of seems low and we're trying to get a better number from the light plant. Um, but regardless of whether it's 20 or 30 or whatever, 61% um, of the buildings in Hingham, they were able to evaluate and almost two thirds were deemed solar viable. And a large majority of those were flat roofs or south facing roofs. I have a, I have a uh, south facing roof, um, but east and west facing roofs can be viable as well. So there's huge potential still for residential solar in Hingham. And uh, you know, I, I like to point out that all of our other Hingham Net Zero initiatives really are focused on saving energy. But with this strategy, you can actually become a generator, and we'll see the scale of that in a minute, of renewable clean energy. And so imagine if even 25% of the homes in Hingham um, eventually had solar panels, we'd be probably selling electricity back over the grid to other utilities. It's very exciting. So there's tremendous potential there. Okay, Albert Einstein said uh, when people whined, can't you make quantum physics a little simpler? It's hard to understand. He said things should be as simple as they are, but not simpler. And uh, residential solar is not quantum physics, but it can be a little complex. So we're gonna delve into it a little bit. So you have a more of a technical understanding as Alton Brown likes to say, uh, hang in there, your patients will be rewarded. Okay, solar panels generate power in what's called direct current, DC. You're familiar with that. Uh, household batteries basically use DC power. Your phones, even your computer, your, if you've got a laptop, um, for instance, you, you know, it's, it's being transformed from AC from your plug to, uh, to DC. Utilities transmit power over the grid in alternating current, okay, AC, because it's easier to step that down to different voltages or step it up. So for instance, we're all familiar with high voltage lines. They use that to, to transmit power over long distances. Um, and then for household use, they step it down through a series of transformers uh, to a lower voltage, typically 120, 240 for household use um, with very little loss of electricity. Um, by the way, voltage means pressure. So it's really the, the pressure of the electrons flowing through the wire. Best analogy is think about your water pipes and your water pressure. It's exactly the same kind of thing. So your DC solar panel output is converted into AC by uh, this magic box that we're gonna look at in a minute called an inverter. And the, the inverter transforms the DC into AC and, and it directly then feeds your main electrical panel with quote free uh, AC power. And uh, any kilowatt hours that you are not able to use immediately uh, get sent out back into the light plant's grid for others to use. So um, you may actually, uh, I may have uh, neighbors who are using uh, electricity that my solar panels produced. Um, people often ask, uh, you know, if you have uh, a power outage on a sunny day and your panels are chugging away, well, won't you still have power? And um, no, you won't, because the utilities have to insist that the inverter have a sensor that becomes aware of whether or not the power is out or not. And if it's out, then the inverter shuts down your solar panel uh, electricity flow. And the reason for this is because they're gonna dispatch a lineman to your neighborhood to uh, work on the wires and they don't want any current there. And believe it or not, your panels produce significant AC current from the, uh, from the inverter. So they don't want to risk having a lineman uh, electrocuted. So th this whole arrangement's called anti-islanding. You're not an island. Uh, as John Dunn said, you, no man's an island and neither are you. 
So it's a safety uh, mechanism. Here's a picture of the magic box. And uh, I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can see my cursor, but here's the, here's the line coming down uh, directly to the left of the box from the solar panels. It goes into this magic box called the inverter and that comes out the bottom and goes right into your electrical panel. And there's the current, there's the electricity there available for you, for you to use. What you may not be able to use, and this is typically what you're gonna find, especially say in the spring and the fall, uh, when you're not running maybe your heating system and you don't, you're not using a lot of electricity, um, whatever you don't use goes right back out because it's got to flow somewhere. Electricity's got to flow. Uh, it goes right back out through your meter, okay, uh, back into the grid. And the meter talks to the light plant and says, Borger sent this number of kilowatt hours out into the grid. And so we need to give them a credit for that, okay? Um, so how do you get savings on your electric bill from this arrangement? Well, uh, the first uh, way you get it is through avoided cost. Because every, every kilowatt hour that you get from your panels, uh, that's electricity you don't have to buy from the light plant. Okay, so that's all savings. And even if your panels produce less than what you're using, you know, every kilowatt hour you produce, again, is one that you don't have to buy. So it, it generates savings. If your panels at certain times produce more than what you can immediately use, uh, as we said, it goes back into the grid and you get a credit from the light plant on your bill. And that credit is calculated by the number of solar kilowatt hours that you sent back into the grid times their average wholesale cost. Um, and in effect, you become a little supplier of electricity to your utility. And this whole arrangement is called net metering. You'll, you'll hear that phrase. And this is the way uh, net metering has been implemented um, in Hingham, uh, it works a little differently in other parts of the country with other utilities, but this is, this is the way it works in Hingham. Uh, so I like to think about this uh, in terms of what I call two streams of value. And again, the first stream of value is the uh, electricity that your solar array produces that you're able to use immediately, and therefore you don't have to buy, and it's avoided cost, and that's worth a little more than 17 cents per kilowatt hour to you, okay? 53% of my solar output is used immediately and represents this avoided cost, it's pure savings. Um, the kilowatt hours produced by your array that you were not able to use, again, we, we, we said go back into the grid, in effect, you become a supplier and the light plant pays you its average wholesale cost per kilowatt hour right now, or, or when I did the presentation, it was uh, almost 11 cents. By the way, these two metrics, the retail and the wholesale price per kilowatt hour, these were done months ago and um, they're not exactly accurate right now, and they may not be exactly accurate in six months, but they're representative enough so that it will uh, be useful for the purpose of illustration. Uh, to use these in our uh, financial analysis. They're, you know, they're off by maybe a half a cent uh, or less. Um, so 47% of my output um, is actually contributed back to the grid and I get this uh, average wholesale cost. Um, okay, how do you monetize these two streams of value? Well, let's look at the way it works. And, and I wanna call your attention to the the blue box called monthly dollar value. That's our starting point. What we're assuming in this financial example is that you've got an average electric bill per month of about 150 bucks, okay? And the way I like to ask people to think about that is, you know, and if you, uh, I understand that when they taught home ec economics they, and they taught budgeting, uh, they would suggest that you get a bunch of envelopes and, and mark them food and rent and gasoline and electricity. So think about that you've got an envelope marked electricity and every month you stick 150 bucks cash in there, all right? You're gonna see how powerful that 150 bucks a month is, what it can do for you. It can put solar panels on your roof and still give you money in your pocket in terms of savings. 
So it, for a $150 monthly electric bill, what that means is you're spending $141.14 for uh, to buy electricity. Uh, the balance, the $8.86, that's your uh, customer charge that the light plant charges you regardless of whether you buy uh, one kilowatt hour or a thousand, okay? So this is kind of the scene before you've decided to install solar. And the value of the kilowatt hours that you're buying, uh, that you're spending this uh, $141.14 for, if you will, um, is worth almost $34,000. That's what you're spending. And, you know, I can take this number, 141.14, and divided by the retail price that you're paying per kilowatt hour, and I can tell you how many kilowatt hours you bought, you're using, and that's the number is 818, okay? Um, if you add in, as I said, the $8.86 monthly customer charge, what this all means is that pre-solar, you're spending uh, $150 and over 240 months, that totals $36,000. Uh, that's a hefty chunk of change. All right, so you have uh, installed solar. Um, the solar, and this is these kilowatt hours now for solar, uh, these are not projections or estimates. This is actual data from the panels on the roof uh, over my head. So the solar kilowatt hours that you're gonna use uh, directly, immediately, based on my experience, my real data, uh, you're going to use 383 kilowatt hours. And that's worth to you, you can, you know, calculate what that's worth per month. And then you can annualize that and project it over 20 years. That's worth almost $16,000 to you in avoided cost over 20 years. Um, the 47% of your output that you're not able to use immediately and you sell back to the light plant that's equal to 342 kilowatt hours. And that's worth, when you project it out over 20 years, that's worth uh, almost $9,000, 8,837. So the totals, you can see your um, panels are producing um, electricity worth, in total, $103 to you. And uh, that's about, that's almost 70% of your, uh, $150 previous bill before solar. It represents uh, 80, 88% in terms of the number of kilowatt hours. So if you divide 726 by 818, that's worth, um, that's about 88%. That's a metric, as I said, that your installer will give you as part of their estimate. Um, so keep this magic number $150 and, and, and imagine the envelope with $150 in it as we begin to step through this. All right, so you decide to buy panels. Um, one of the things that Sunroof will do is it will estimate uh, how big an array you can fit on your roof. And uh, this is a function of the size of your roof and also um, the size of your electric bill. Now, if you have a really small electric bill, it may not rep recommend the maximum that your roof could handle so my recommendation would be just keep bumping up your uh, your electric bill till the prescribed uh, size of the array you get back from sunroof stays the same. So when I did that for my roof, um, uh, I ended up with 6.8 kilowatts designed, it's called designed capacity. That's 6,800 uh, watts. Um, and for that size and array, um, sunroof said, you're probably going to spend $25,800, which is remarkably close to the DOER's uh, estimate that you're going to spend $3.78 per watt. That calculates out to $25,700. So they're very, very, very close, which is... Uh, Encouraging and it inspires confidence. Uh, people know what they're doing, I guess. We talked about the federal investment tax credit. So for that size and array, um, assuming you don't have to do anything else, just buying the, the panels and putting them up, um, 
and and by the way, this this figure is an all in cost in terms of buying the panels. Typically, I think the inverter is included, and um, the the labor, which is significant to install them. So that's why most installers will suggest that you max out your roof because a part of your cost, the significant part of your cost, is having that crew there. It took them one day to install my panels. Okay. Um, so there's your federal tax credit. You're going to qualify undoubtedly for the full thousand dollars of the mass uh, state tax credit. Again, these are credits. They're not exemptions or deductions. They're money back on your taxes that you get. We talked about the rebate. This is a recent program that is really quite welcome. It helps make the whole thing more affordable. And um, that's equal to, in this example, because we've got a 6.8 kilowatt array, you get 60 cents uh, per watt, and that calculates out to $4,080. Um, and as we'll, um, as we'll discuss, Hingham is also going to give you a credit, but that is doled out over a period of many months. So we're not going to count that up front, but we'll count it later. And so the total incentives that you're going to get back on your $25,000, $800 investment um, is $11,788, which means you're only going to have to finance $14,000. That's a little more than 45% of your installed cost. So you can see right away that uh, the federal government, the state government, uh, the utilities want you to do this and they're trying to make it as affordable as possible for you. So let's see how this looks when you get into actually paying for it. Um, <clears throat> So I use the example that um, that uh, I think Sunroof also used. They they said they uh, their metrics are based on financing uh, a solar array over 20 years. So that's what I used, and I I used the interest rate of four percent. Okay, so you're going to pay. Um, see, I I can't see the. I think it's eighty six dollars. Maybe you can see it. Um, about $86 a month. This is $84 and 92 cents, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's what you're gonna pay each month for 240 months, okay? And um, so you're gonna pay out a total of 20,000, uh, almost $380, all right. How are the incentives and the uh, light plants credit gonna help you do that? Well. They're going to more than help you do that. They're going to cover that cost in its entirety, and you're still going to have $8,400 left over in pure savings. So how does that work? Well, here's your credit from the light plant, $4,080. Here are here's the total value of the two streams of solar, two streams of value from solar, $24,720. And uh, so that the total of those two is 28,800, okay? The, uh, so the net effective cost of your loan over 20 years is actually a negative number because you're not, you're not paying anything really. Uh, these savings and the light plant credit are covering it in entirety and you still have $8,400 left over. So in effect, your net cost to purchase solar over 20 years is $8,400. Uh, and, and actually it's not your net cost. That's, that's less than what you're paying. So you, you're buying your panels and you're still uh, putting in your pocket savings worth $8,400. And that's also the, the effective cost of electricity that you're going to pay with solar. You're not going to pay anything. You're going to, uh, you're going to save $8,400. If you didn't uh, do solar, what would you have paid? Well, that's just your $150 monthly bill times 240 months, and that's uh, worth $36,000. That's a lot of money. Um, so what does that look like? Your total savings over 20 years due to installing solar are going to be a total of $44,400. Plus, uh, after you pay off the loan, 
for years 21 through 25, which is the guaranteed life of the, of the panels, you're going to continue to generate savings of $103 per month from the two streams of value. Let me go back and you can eyeball that again. There it is. Monthly value, solar totals month per month, $103. Okay. So um, in addition, when you, um, so th this is this $103 over that five years up to the 25th year, that's worth an additional $6,180 to you. So total savings over the guaranteed life of the panels, which is 25 years, is in excess of $50,000. And uh, again, compare that to the cost of, where, where did I go here? Uh, um, what did we say? I think that's in I can't read that. Uh, number and below the 50,000, where it says comparative cost of electricity without solar over 25 years. 45,000. 45,000, okay. So you're, you know, that's the swing. Instead of sp spending 45,000, you're saving in excess of 50,000. Um, okay. Remember I talked about the envelope with the 150 bucks in it <laughs> that you're gonna stick in there every month. Uh, let's see how the monthly cash flows work to give you a better idea of exactly what's going on here. So uh, we talked about your starting point, which is $150 per month. You got to pay your uh, customer charge of $8.86. You're, you're buying, uh, you're spending $141.14 uh, previous to solar on, uh, on just pure electricity. Now you've installed solar, your loan payment's $84.92. Um, what's your electricity bill going to be? It's going to be zero because it's completely wiped out by your $4,080 credit. So it takes you about uh, seven years and three months to work through that credit, okay? And then when you're... Um, when you're done, so your uh, effective monthly cost for electricity in years one through roughly seven um, is going to be effectively your loan payment. That's all you're going to pay for electricity, plus you're paying for getting panels on your roof. After your credit's gone, okay, your uh, electricity bill each month is gonna be only $47. And that's simply the $150 that you would have spent minus uh, your 103, uh, solar, uh, $103 uh, solar savings from the two streams of, of value. So your effective monthly cost um, would be 131.92, okay? And uh, so even after you've used the credit, okay, the panels are putting out enough electricity, so you're still saving eighteen dollars a month, and you're st and you're still paying off the loan. Okay, um, so I just threw a bunch of numbers at you, and I'm sure they went by like a blizzard. So I want to make sure if anybody's got any questions, don't hesitate to let Ann know, because uh, I know I just threw a lot of information at you. But what I wanted to do was give you uh, an overall sense of how the dollars flow and how powerful those two streams of savings are, uh, especially when combined with the light plant credit. We'll, we'll talk about the light plant credit a little bit more, but it, it um, in this example, you can see that you you can buy your panels and still save money on your electric bill. Um, it's it's a great deal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> John, before you move on, uh, yeah. Katie has a quick question. Is there any planned phase out of the federal tax credit that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, they did lower it, as I said, from 30% to 26%. That's a good question. We should research that. Um, but, the, but pursuant to Katie's question, one of the things we're going to say later on is, um, you know, all of these programs should be viewed as time limited and financially limited. For instance, I believe the 
uh, state, the DOER uh, rebate program is, I think that's being funded with a pot of money that totals $3 million and they're accepting applications through the end of this year. Um, it's kind of like uh, a game of musical chairs. You don't want to be standing up when the, when the music stops. Um, you want to make sure if you're going to do this, that you're not procrastinating, that you, you get on it because again, these are time limited programs and with, with a limited pot of money. So, but we'll, we'll check that out. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the same for any type of incentive for this type of technology, electric vehicles, the incentives sure. are always moving around. So we are starting to get a few more questions. Um, okay. Jenny Hook is asking, will the contractor help you coordinate the paperwork and applying for the various? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's yeah. a great question. In fact, under the DOER uh, program, and Valdir, jump in if you if you have anything to add. But my understanding is the paperwork all has to be filed by the installer. So they, you know, that's part of their being in this business is helping you navigate, um, uh, you know, these the the, the the requirements for applying for these uh, incentives. Uh, Paul Hinu of the municipal lighting plant told me that they also have a separate application that you will probably need um, your installer to uh, at least help you fill out, if not uh, handle it completely themselves. I, I can help out with that question. Okay. Yeah, sure. so um, usually 99% of the time, the installer is the one who is filling out the application. And what we really only need from the customer is the customer to sign a couple of uh, some paperwork, but yeah. The installer is usually the one who's um, who is the contact person um, for the solar application. And right, then, because the application typically is going to have some technical questions that your average homeowner is not going to be able to answer, but the installer, you know, will be able able to answer those questions. Exactly. So yeah, I, we usually ninety percent of the time uh, there are some installers. We had one or two installers only that they um, either refused to take care of it or the, they just didn't know about the program, so they didn't even consider that. So um, if you're considering installing a solar system in your house, I would bring it up to the installer about the, the rebate program because a lot of them also don't know about the rebate program. So well, let, let's, let's push that a little further. Um, Valdir, if if a, a homeowner finds themselves in that position where you know they went with an installer and then they find out, oh, you know, the installer saying, "Look, I don't have time to fill out all this paperwork." Um, will uh, Energy New England or staff from the DOER help the homeowner supplement whatever they can pull out of the installer, or you know, how would that work? Yes, definitely. So we had a okay. couple of customers who. Uh, the installer didn't fill out the paperwork, so they had to go through the whole um, the whole process by themselves. So we helped them out in that case. Yeah, great. That's, but that's a great a great question to ask your installer maybe before signing the contract because I, right. I think it's pretty intimidating to be filing for all those incentives. If they can take care of it for you, I think that's a, a great service. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So and, we have a couple more questions, John. Okay. Of course, they're starting to come in now. So Kristen's asking, do you really get a one-to-one -one credit for the solar energy you are producing or selling to the net? Yes, you do. Uh, but the key thing to remember is that the two different kinds, what I'm calling the two streams of value, you've got, in a way, two different kilowatt hours in play here. You've got the kilowatt hours from your panels that you're able to use immediately. Remember the picture, the line goes from the inverter right into your electrical panel. And uh, if it's winter time and you're burning a lot of electricity, you're gonna use it immediately. That represents avoided cost. And your avoided cost is what you would pay retail if you had to buy 
each of those kilowatt hours from the light plant. And then the second type of kilowatt hour is the kilowatt hour that you can't use immediately because it's a warm spring day. You're not running your heating or your air conditioning, you get the windows open, you maybe have a TV and a few lights on. Your panels are chugging away because it's a sunny day. You're gonna send most of that juice back over the grid to the light plant. But again, now you're a supplier and you're not gonna get the retail price for those kilowatt hours. You're gonna get the light plant's wholesale cost. Right. Okay. okay. So we have a couple more questions. One about the fringe customers in Hingham. So these are the ones not serviced by the light plant. I don't know if we want to deal with that just yet. And then um, Katie's asking about the Tesla Powerwall on whether the solar panels can store, let me see, can store power um, even if the uh, electricity shuts off because you were saying the panels stop if the power goes out. But do you know anything about the Tesla Powerwall and whether it can be used? Um, I do not. And okay. uh, maybe there's somebody on the call who does. My very vague understanding of the Powerwall was that it was basically a solar, a small dedicated solar array that, that, um, that, that charged a battery that you could then use to charge your Tesla. Um, I don't know if we have any electric vehicle owners here who could speak to that, but that was my understanding. So that seems to be an arrangement that's outside of the sort of the standard residential uh, solar panel installation. Because in that case, you're, you're, you're connecting to the grid. So you've got to uh, adhere to all these standards and protocols for being part of the grid. And I, my vague understanding, as I said, was I thought that the power wall was more of a standalone battery charging strategy. Can anybody speak to that? Uh, this is Mike. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Yeah, some of those technologies are just coming out. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some of the inverter manufacturers in Europe that are coming out, out with essentially a, a backup uh, off the grid type scenario that will actually interface with the grid or in our case HMLP, but will also interface with the solar panels on your roof and a, a lithium ion battery that you would have installed in your house. So those technologies are coming to market. They're probably in my opinion, not quite here in the US, but will be very soon. I know they. Um, I know they do have them at the Tesla dealership. They do have a display. You know, they lease panels um, that you can. Well, I guess they rent panels, so you they'll install them on your home, and I think you rent them. Um, but I guess that's a specific company with specific um, technologies. But I'm wondering if we should maybe just park that and kind of go back to the questions that we have coming in, if that's all right. Yeah, well, yeah, this is this is kind of a developmental exercise. We're all learning uh, every yeah. day about this stuff. So as we, uh, we learn more about that, let's agree that we're going to post stuff on the website for everyone, and uh, we'll all kind of move forward together. Sounds good. So did you want to talk briefly, John, about the fringe customers in Hingham, and maybe if Vladir knows anything about whether they qualify for the same incentives that were discussed? You know, Again, Jenny was told by her contractor that they don't qualify. Yeah, and the key question for Jenny, I think, is who is your electric utility? Is it the Hingham Municipal Light Plant or is it uh, Eversource or National Grid? NatGrid, yes. NatGrid is who whose hardware we're on, but we're billed through municipal light but, okay. un but unfortunately because of that arrangement nobody can connect the dots when it comes to these rebates it, it, it's a strange setup that's why i was not asking this question specifically of you john yeah. but yes so um i can kind of help out i guess um so if if you pay your electricity bill to hang them you should be able to qualify for the rebate. Or if you pay for another 
municipality who is participant of the program, uh, you should also be able to qualify for extra the rebate program. This is Val Deere speaking. He's from Energy New England, so he has kind of a special expertise in this. So yes, okay. if you are a customer of Hingham uh, HMLP, uh, you should be able to qualify for the rebate. Yeah. Now, I, I, you know, I don't know if you've approached Paul Hino about this and gotten a straight answer. Um, it's, it's yes, we have. And that's why I was asking, knowing that we had another party on the line, hoping that we might get a different answer. <laughs> well, I think that's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure which, which answer you wanted to hear, but that, that answer sounds pretty good to me. Uh, or, or would you rather, because if you don't do this program, now you're into the main, what I call the mainstream statewide SMART program, which is kind of a different program. And my limited understanding of the SMART program is that it's a lot more complicated. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure uh, at the end of the day where, where you end up, whether you, whether you end up better off with that <clears throat> SMART program that, for instance, you get with a national grid or, or, or uh, Eversource, or, or whether you're better off with the Hingham Municipal Light Plant joint incentive with the DOER, um, just don't know. A bit of homework. We just haven't found a contractor yet that seems to know how it works. So we're just sort of grasping at straws, but I, I know this is something we should take offline. I, I think, well, I would recommend that you write a letter, a formal letter, get it in writing and send your question to the light plant, send it to Energy New England and send it to National Grid and, you know, make them give you an answer and uh, go from there. Because, you know, if you don't get something in writing, you're basically working on the basis of rumor and innuendo. And Valdir is very knowledgeable. So I, I trust his judgment that you should be able to get the joint incentive from the light plant now, maybe that's news to Paul Hino, and he's got to close the loop with e and &E. So, John, in the interest of time, I think we'll keep moving. Yeah. Um, did you have other slides to get to, or did you want me to continue with some of the questions? Um, you know what? I've got just a few slides. So let me... Let okay, me, why, don't, uh, why don't you wrap it up, and then we'll keep going with the yeah. slides. But just to know, uh, Lori Freeman has weighed in, and she notes that the federal tax credit is actually going down to 22% in 2021. Oh, okay, that's, that's useful to know. Yeah. Um, bad news, but useful to know. Right. So, again, seize the day if you're thinking of doing this. Yeah. Um, move, move quickly. Um, let me try to wrap this up. Um, so we just want to talk for a minute about, and then, and then uh, we'll, we'll get into questions, some more questions. Uh, as you said, solar clearly generates impressive savings. It's clearly a long-term investment in your house. Uh, however, you know, we talked about it would take, you know, a while for you to use, uh, use up the credit. Um, and uh, even if you, um, you know, pay off your loan early, uh, if you're not sure that you're going to be able to stay in your house for many years, um, you know, now that puts you at some risk of forfeiting part of the Hing Hingham Municipal Light Plant credit. Laura Burns was in that situation. She had to walk away from part of her credit because uh, she and her husband decided to, to you know, move to, to a different house and uh, she couldn't take it with her. Um, if they, and we're talking about of this with the light plant, just so you know, because uh, an important part of this is for you to be aware of kind of what's in play and how you can maybe influence some of these policy decisions. So John, I'll just jump in here because you're talking about what happens when you move and losing yeah. the credit. Yeah. So Mike Sutton was asking, what happens if you sell your house before the financing load is paid off? Does it have to be repaid or must the home buyer assume it? I think that's a matter for negotiation with the buyer. Um, uh, it, it would seem to me that it might be cleaner for you just to, I mean, the loan is in your name. Uh, you can uh, negotiate um, a price that will make you whole to paying off the loan. Or alternatively, maybe you can work something out. That I think that's for the parties to kind of, to kind of negotiate. Uh, 
Right. It doesn't okay. concern the light plant, so it's a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they don't want to get into that. Um, so I, we're trying, we're talking about the light plant. We're basically saying, you know, you really, sh you really should seriously consider uh, making the credit a rebate. Because if, if that light plant credit was a rebate, you're talking about buying a system of this size for under $10,000. I mean, that's a, that's a used car for a college kid. You know, a lot of people can just self-finance, you know, or it's a, it's, it's a moderate drain on their home equity line of credit. Um, so we'll, we'll see where we end up with that. Um, the other, just a couple of other things, you know, it's obviously not clear in the future real estate market, especially now with however that's gonna look with the coronavirus, it's not clear how the market is gonna value solar panels. It's probably a good vet bet that they're going to be worth something. It's again, as I, I like to say, it's it's not like putting in a swimming pool where sometimes people just want to fill it up. Um, so as we said, the the DOER program uh, that E and E is helping to administer here is limited in aggregate funding. It's uh, I think the initial pot's three million dollars. Um, don't procrastinate. Move. Try to move on this. It takes a while to get these things done. Um, and so you wanna give yourself as much time as possible. Um, method, the cost of financing are important. Just be aware that a sizable portion, in fact, most of the incentives here are tax-based. So worst case, for instance, if you had panels installed in January, uh, well, you wouldn't be getting your tax uh, credits back to you until the following March. So that's like 14 months. Meanwhile, you've got you, you've to figure out a way to finance the full cost of the project before you get that money back. A lot of people just take out a loan for the, for the full cost of the project. And then as the, 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 in, the credits and the rebates roll in, they just dump those into the loan as a uh, huge extra payments to principal and uh, pay it down that much more rapidly. Um, just a couple other things. If your electric service, this happened to me, is inside a fenced area, the town's going to require you to move it to an easily accessible area because they're shut off switches for both your electric service and your solar panels, and the fire department wants to be able to get at those easily. Your home insurance is probably going to increase because you've increased the value of your dwelling. So I think mine went up $133. The good news is that uh, your real estate assessed value um, and therefore your taxes don't go up. And so uh, that's a benefit that the town is, is giving you. So the next couple of slides are two solar companies, two uh, installers that we've used. I use Boston Solar. Several people have used New Watt Energy. They're, based, uh, they're both based in Woburn, both very good, very professional. Um, that's a great starting point. Talk to them. If you Google uh, solar installers, South Shore, Boston, you'll probably come up with more. Uh, okay, that's pretty much, let me just uh, orient people to what else is in the, quickly in the, the, the presentation that I'm not going to speak to. There's some stuff here on solar loans. Uh, <laughs> there's probably more information than you would ever want to know about how to read your light plant bill if you do install solar. It's, uh, let me just say that it's counterintuitive. Uh, and so you're going to need this guide. Uh, it took us a while to figure this out. Um, let's see, you got some pictures of the meters. Uh, I, I described the, what I call the baseline Massachusetts smart program that applies to the rest of the state. Uh, in other than municipal uh, light plant areas. Um, there's some notes here about the data and methodology that I used uh, that you can look at. Some more information about solar and Hingham. Something called power purchase agreements, which no one seems to be enthusiastic um, uh, about at this point. And the Department of Energy Resources said, eh, you know, you're going to do better off generally uh, owning um, another slide on net metering, um, and then uh, our standard slide for Hingham Net Zero on, you know, if you're concerned about climate change, join us. Here's some things that you can do. So, great. We're, uh, <laughs> we're through the slides and uh, into more questions. And so, if you're interested in looking at those slides that John just pulled through quickly, they will be available on our website. 
ingemnetzero.org. And that's where you can go ahead and take your time and look through all these slides um, and take more notes. And this um, event will also, the recording will also be shared on our website in the future. So, okay, we have another question here from Kristen. You mentioned the different installers and she's asking, you know, the technology is evolving so fast. Are there different types of solar panels and which one is the best? Like if you're looking for an EV, there's different makes and models, but when it comes to solar panels, is the technology pretty much fixed or are there different options to look at? Well, I, you know, I'm going to, uh, let me just take a quick crack at that and then I'll invite uh, Michael Reeve to, to weigh in. But because um, as I said, we were talking last evening about the fact that, you know, yeah, the technology is moving along. They're making the, the panels uh, more powerful, more efficient per square foot. Um, my experience with Boston Solar was they like to use LG panels, but they also offer other um, they offer other brands. There's, there's trade-offs that they can discuss with you um, in terms of, and often it's, um, you know, if, if your installer has kind of a high volume purchase agreement with one manufacturer, the way Boston Solar did with LG, that's kind of, they, they tell you, I, we think we, we can give you the best deal on LG panels, but if you want a different, I think there's a company called SunPower that they all, also offered. Um, you know, they're willing to talk to you about that. Michael, do you have anything to add on, on that? To add on that? Yeah, from the, module, from the module standpoint that the industry is very much consolidated. So the players that are there now are, are the large volume players. Yeah. Personally, I like to go with a brand name that has a deep pocket and is not gonna go out of business. Right. So an, an LG or a Panasonic or a SunPower are, yeah. are among my top three. Okay, great. Does that help? Good. Yeah, I think that helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And then Jenny's asking about maintenance costs during the operational period. You mentioned that there's not a ton of maintenance, but um, there might be not issues. That I'm aware of. Yeah. And again, I'll invite Michael and Valdir to jump in. But what Boston Solar told me, and this is proven, you know, for three years, three plus years. Um, there's no maintenance at all. And in fact, um, Boston Solar guarantees the output that they've projected for you for my panels for 10 years and it's monitored through an automatic reporting system uh, by a company named uh, Solar Edge. So uh, there's a, a monitor um, that talks to my router and sends regular reporting over the internet to Solar Edge and to Boston Solar and they're monitoring that automatically and if your panels were suddenly to dip uh, that would raise a flag for them and they would give me a call and say, you know, we got to come out and check out uh, your pin. They, I, my understanding is they can actually uh, diagnose which panel or panels are malfunctioning. But my understanding is that's pretty rare, but I'd invite Mike and Valdir to, uh, to weigh in on that. Yeah, so from what I've known, um, problems with the solar panels are not very frequent. Yeah. Uh, the, usually the issues come with the inverter. Yeah. Uh, so it's important that you have a reliable inverter and you don't have uh, just uh, like a very cheap inverter. You want, you want a, a good inverter usually for your system. And that's, that's usually where the, the problems come from. Yeah. You know, your installer doesn't want you to have problems. So they're not going to want to sell you junk that's going to break down in a few years, you know? So there's some self-protection, I think, built in there. But, you know, it's always good to ask and ask if there's a guarantee on the inverter. If so, how long, all those wonderful, it's like buying a refrigerator in a way, you know. Right. Uh, um, we have a follow up question. Are there any issues with New England winter? So I'm guess we're, I'm guess uh, Kristen's talking about the ice and snow buildup on the roofs, if there's any issues with that. What I found, and again, Valdir and Mike and weigh in, well, what I found is that even after a heavy snowstorm, as soon as the sun comes out, uh, you know, the sun's going to melt the, the snow right off those panels. In fact, you have to be a little careful because uh, on occasion you can get an avalanche from right under your panels because it'll all sort of let go at once and you have to be alert to that. But 
The sun is very powerful and it shines on the panels. Uh, it melts the snow and ice underneath, you know, right, right at the panels, warms up the glass and it comes off pretty quickly and uh, you're back in business. And a similar question asking about wind, wind events and hurricanes. So the irony with trying to help solve the climate crisis is that we're dealing with extreme weather regardless yeah. of our efforts at this point, but how, how durable are they in the face of extreme weather and wind? Well, my understanding is that they are extremely durable. Uh, they um, take a great deal of care in uh, using lag screws that go right through your roof and they, they will, um, they mark where your rafters are, okay? So they're going right into your roof beams, uh, right into the thickest part of the wood. So and that's the grid. And then they have very robust fastenings to fasten each panel to its place in the grid. And um, I, you know, I, I have not heard of, of any, but you know, in a hurricane, if you're dealing with 150 mile per hour winds or God forbid we have a tornado, you know, uh, this, this, these are mechanical physical things that are right. subject to damage. And, and, you know, you, that's, that's part of the risk of being in the real world is. Yes. Right, right. Okay, well, we currently don't have um, any additional questions. Feel free to type them in right away if you do. Um, if not, I'll start to wrap things up. Like I mentioned, this presentation will be on our website and this webinar will be on our YouTube channel, which we will share as well on the website and on our Facebook page. Um, and we've mentioned climate coaching a few times you know, we completely understand that if you're thinking of undertaking anything like this, it can be really intimidating. We're not really sure what we're getting ourselves into. That's why we have folks like John, we have other coaches as well, who can support you as you kind of navigate um, this process. So please don't hesitate to send us an email, hinghamnet0 at gmail.com. And we'd be more than happy to help you with any questions you have about installers, which brand of panels, we, we are so passionate about getting to this low carbon future that we are more than happy to volunteer our time uh, to work towards this direction. So please don't hesitate to reach out and tell your friends and family. Um, we have one more question here from Jenny before we officially wrap up. Is there any appearance, I guess aesthetics, uh, that might be negative to property sale value with respect to the solar panels? I mean, you did mention that Zillow um, estimates there's a roughly 4% increase in property value. I mean, but I can totally appreciate that aesthetics might be a concern for some folks, especially if it's on the front of your nice salt box New England house. Um, I don't know if any other solar owners on the call want to weigh in on how that factored into their decision, but John, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll start us off, and that's a great question. And in fact, my wife was, she's an artist, and so she... <laughs> You know, uh, she was she was kind of concerned, and uh, we we um, had a whole conversation about should we buy the version of the LG panel that has white lines that make it a little more visible up on the roof. They're about five percent more uh, efficient, or should we just go with all black? Some people prefer all black, and where we ended up was uh, you know let's go for the most efficient panels. What I found is that. Now, there may be some styles of house where this isn't the case, but let me uh, turbocharge back here. Here we go. Uh, here's my house. Here are my panels. No one has ever walked by and commented on the panels, and I never look at them. They become subliminal. If you think about it, you don't usually look at your roof. Uh, now, as you said, there may be some styles of houses where the roof's more prominent and, um, you know, it becomes more of a cosmetic concern. But, you know, your shingles are typically um, going to be a dark color because we live in New England and we want to absorb, we want solar gain, okay, and dark absorbs um, more sunlight. So your shingles are going to be a dark color. The panels are basically just another shade of a dark color. And, um, you know, as I said, I think they become subliminal. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think in particular with your house, it covers the whole roof, so there's not a lot of variation between the panels and the and the shingles. Right, right. Yeah. and you can see the white lines there. Um, yeah. uh, but you know, as I said, uh, you know, there, there's you just if you're standing outside the house looking up, it's not that you go, you know, it's not like, oh my gosh, you know, that's not a traditional house. That's that's got these strange things on the roof. Um, you know, you get used to it almost immediately. Yeah. People don't notice it. Yeah. I mean, it ultimately, it's, you know, a personal choice if it's that important to you. But it's but, a good question. I don't mean yeah, to minimize it. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's certainly it's, something I've thought I struggled about. with it. You know, my wife and I went round and around for a while, and then we found, okay, let's go with the more efficient. And almost immediately, she said, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, they look fine. And, um, we, you know, it wasn't a problem. But good question. Well, your house looks great. And I know from the last forum, we saw your, your heat pumps. Everything looks great. <laughs> the lowest carbon footprint in town. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, special thanks to Valdir from Energy New England. We really appreciate the inputs that you provided. And if there are no more questions, I think we're ready to sign off. So thanks to everyone. And um, stay tuned for future events.